You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Thank you for joining me. We are talking about wheat again. Put your sandwich down, put your pizza down, uh, get ready to talk about wheat. If you haven't listened to episode 132 with Dr. Tom O'Brien, then I suggest after you've listened to this one, you go back and check that out as well before you pick your sandwich back up. Um, I really have been getting into the nutrition stuff lately, as you know, and I've really been enjoying all the information that's been coming out around it and how it's relevant to our anxiety and how we can overall improve our mental health, okay? Um, Over at anxietypodcast.com, if you haven't been there yet, please visit. There's a variety of things there for you. You can click on the free tab and get my ebook and audio download and that kind of stuff. Um, On the front page, you, you can also click and join the Less Anxiety, More Life community and get involved that way kind of keep up with the regular chat Um, if you want to work with me specifically click on the coaching page and you can find out a bit more about what I do one-on-one with people I work with a kind of limited number of one-on-one clients at a time because I put a lot of energy and effort into transforming and helping them kind of change and uh, overcome anxiety. So if that's something you want to do, then check that out. You can book a time. We'll jump on the phone and uh, see if there's a fit for us to work together. Okay, so let's talk about Cindy O'Meara. Cindy O'Meara, today's guest, is an internationally acclaimed nutritionist, author, documentary maker, and founder of Changing Habits, a health and nutrition business. She's been researching and challenging diet conventions to inspire people to make smarter food choices for more than 30 years. Um, Changing Habits started in 1990. Uh, Cindy was writing a regular newspaper column at the time, and that went on to then transform into a book, which became an international bestseller, selling over 60,000 copies. It's been translated into three languages. So, you know, she's on to something. She has also this year launched a documentary called What's With Wheat, which investigates the growing epidemic of wheat intolerance um, and why after eating wheat for thousands of years is now linked to so many health problems. Um I suggest you watch the documentary. I'm going to put the link below in the show notes so you can check it out. She has on here some of the foremost kind of experts, including uh, Dr. Paul Mutter, Sarah Ballantyne, Dr. Terry Walls, all these kind of internationally renowned experts in this stuff, some of which are future guests uh, for the Anxiety Podcast as well, which is kind of exciting. Um, and the documentary kind of features or, or focuses on modern agriculture practices in terms of wheat growing, the increased use of chemicals and pesticides, and we get into all of this in our conversation. Um, it was watched by over 150,000 people globally in the first week, and that's gone on to kind of take off in a huge way. It's going to be available um, kind of worldwide on uh, Netflix and other platforms, hopefully later this year, but you can get it from the website right now. So if you listen to this and you're like, I got to get my hands on that. I got to watch it, which I recommend you do. I sat and watched it and loved it. Um, then you can get access to it. Okay. So without further ado, let's chat to Cindy and get into more detail. Here we go. Okay. So Cindy O'Meara, welcome to the anxiety podcast. Thanks Tim. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah. Excited. You know, as we were just talking about prior to hitting the record button, I'm, I'm super excited about nutrition and food and, and really the impact that can have on our mental health. And I know you are as well. So it's, uh, it's certainly a good, uh, good chance for us to get into that in more detail. So before we kind of start doing that, it would be great to understand a bit about your background and kind of what was the, you know, what was the thing that made you start changing your life and the way that you approach food? Oh, wow. That's, that, that's a big question. Um, because my, my background, um, is what actually got me to doing what I'm doing right now. And I'm, I'm from a a farming background where in the 1940s, my grandfather, uh, had the opportunity to come part of the chemical revolution. So on the cornfields in Iowa, USA, they were um, spraying DDT 
as well as arsenic and lead, which have now been banned. They were banned back in 1955. So I'm from a farming background. I'm from um, my mum was the oldest of 11, and we grew th- we grew food, and we also made everything from scratch. So that's all I knew growing up in the 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. My father was a pharmacist who believed that um, the medications that he was prescribing to people back in the 50s were actually making them sicker and he remembers this one particular person that would come that came in and she was a sprighty 70 year old and she had a little bit of arthritis the doctor put her on some medication and over the next 12 months she ended up on many medications because he realized that they were the side effects of the first medication the second medication the third medication the fourth so he he wanted to look for a new um, health paradigm. And so he um, heard about this thing called chiropractic back in the 50s, which was very much a, a brand new profession. And he went to Iowa, USA and became a chiropractor, met my mom. And so I was brought up in a household of fresh food, everything made from scratch, um, no medications. My father was completely against any medications except in a life-threatening situation. And so I'm 56 and I, I've never had a medication. So basically I was brought up in um, a very vitalistic, holistic lifestyle. But as I was heading into my 40s, I started to get aches and pains. I started to gain weight. Mm -hmm. Um, I got anxiety at three in the morning. So I'd wake up. I, um, I had tightness in my throat. I just had these little niggling issues that wouldn't go away. And it was about 18 months of them getting worse and worse and worse, putting on more weight, anxiety, not going away, hip pain, back pain, you know, and I just went, hang on, something's not working. And so I went back to my education and I went back to the fact that I had done anthropology and cultural anthropology through university at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I realized that we lived a very seasonal, we lived a life that was um, an ebb and flow of food availability we would eat certain foods in the summer and then different foods in the winter. In the summer, we'd put on weight, and in the winter, we would take off that weight. Mm. And so I thought my I must have had toxicity in my fat. But these were my thoughts that were going through my head. So I thought, yeah. I need to eat the foods of the winter of the hunter-gatherer. And that's what I did. I ate lean meats because there were no fat animals when it was winter. So I ate lean meats, um, greens because there could have been some greens sprouting through. So I ate greens and any winter fruits that were available in where I live, I ate. And over a three week period, uh, I, my brain fog disappeared. I had absolute clarity of mind, which I didn't even know I had until it cleared. Mm. Um, Stopped waking up at three in the morning with anxiety, no more back pain, no more hip pain. All these little maladies, and they weren't little, they were becoming, um, they were hindering my life, all just disappeared over a three-week period. And I, I thought, what what just happened? You know, what were the foods that I was consuming that was causing the problem? And so what I did was that I started to introduce foods back into my diet. Um, and as I introduced each food, I realized which ones were working for me and which ones were not. And my biggest problem of all, I realized, was um, the wheat grain. So whenever I ate bread or a pasta or made something with wheat, I would inflame, I would have sore back, sore hip, um, that anxiety would come back. And so I made the decision six years ago now, five, six years ago now, to give up wheat completely, and I have, and never gained the weight back, have mm-hmm. no more back pain, no more hip pain. If I am, if wheat um, is, if I'm affected by wheat because I, I've gone out to someone's place and it's got some weight in it and they didn't tell me. I do have a little indicator that tells me that something's wrong and it's my right uh, little finger, a knuckle. (laughs) It will get, yeah, it will get really sore and I'll Mm. go, okay, I've obviously eaten it. Um, And it tells me, you know, be careful, move on. 
And so that's, I guess, you know, wh- where my interest has come is that it was, it's been this amazing journey. And, and by doing cultural anthropology, it got me so interested in nutrition that I came back to Australia and I did my Bachelor of Science majoring in nutrition, about to do my dietetics, but I didn't agree with what I was being taught in nutrition and dietetics and really struggled with the dietetics program and decided that there's no way that I could be under the guidance of the of the Dietetics Association of Australia and chose not to do my dietetics degree and instead use my cultural anthropology and my love of science and nutrition to realise what the body needed. Now, that was 32 years ago. And in 32 years the um, knowledge that we now have about nutrition and more cultures and about how it affects the physical body and the mind is just growing at a phenomenal rate and more so in this last decade when we're seeing an increase in um, mental illnesses um, and more and more people suffering from anxiety, both both male and female, and um, depression is a huge problem. Uh, you know, I know around the world it's a huge problem, but I definitely know statistically here in Australia, one in five will suffer from depression or some sort of mental illness. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, I think that those stats are probably accurate in well, certainly in North America as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting story. One of the, one of the things that you, you wrote, which resonated with me is, is that you said that health is not separated by the neck, um, and that the brain is part of the body and the nervous system and that, that, and I've kind of talked a bit about that before, how physical and mental health are, are totally linked, but I would love you to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, the the more we learn, the more we realize that there is an intrinsic link between the physical body and the the brain. And it's via the vagus nerve, which, um, you know, is, is the connection, what they call the brain-gut connection. So it connects the gut, what's happening in the gut to the brain. Um, we've also starting to realize that the um, – bacteria that we hold in our nasal passages and in our sinuses, if they're in a pathological state, they're in dysbiosis, so you have constant sinus infections, then that leads to a um, a toxicity to the brain as well. We know that the microbiome, which I would say that um, if people are interested in how they'll have heard of the microbiome. So we, we have a, a, a microbiome that covers our skin and, like I said, our nasal passages, our sinuses, and it also um, is in our digestive tract. And that digestive tract creates uh, or the microbiome in the digestive tract not only makes vitamin K, but also digests our foods, help us uh, digest our food, help us make short-chain fatty acids, which are really important for neurological health. But the most important thing of all is that our microbiome makes our aromatic amino acids. And our aromatic amino acids are the precursors to our neurotransmitters. So our neurotransmitters can include serotonin, noradrenaline, dopamine and our sleeping neurotransmitter melatonin so we make 90 percent of the stuff that makes us think makes our nervous system work within the gut and if we are eating the wrong foods and not feeding the gut if we're taking way too many antibiotics or taking steroids or even taking um proton pump inhibitors which are antacids usually, usually, not always, but usually they're protein pump inhibitors, they also affect um, digestion, the microbiome, and um, can have effects on not only heart health but also mental health. So these are the things that we are beginning to realise are important factors in our physical health but also so intrinsically with our mental health. Mm. Yeah, super interesting. And and one of the things that you said earlier about, you kind of alluded to the fact that you got some clarity that you kind of didn't know was possible. And that's, I think, you know, when we, when we consider, um, a lot of people are eating a lot of wheat, a lot of sugar, 
a lot of dairy, probably a lot of alcohol, a lot of processed food, and this stuff's all layered on top of each other. Um, certainly for myself, um, in my experience, as I, as I undid that and kind of peeled some of those layers off, I wasn't even aware of how good I could feel. Um, unfortunately, to the detriment of the fact that now when I do drink alcohol, um, I find it probably affects me more because my, my, my slate is cleaner before I start, if that makes sense. Um, so I think it, it's, it's tougher from that point of view. I've also, um, you don't know this, Cindy, the listeners do, cause I, I, I do tend to talk about it from time to time, but, um, I've, I personally eat a sort of ketogenic style diet. So I've been off wheat for a while myself. Um, and being a, being a fat burner, as they say, um, I find, I, I love the clarity. Like that's, that's why I did it for the anxiety, for the, the benefit of just feeling good all the time. Um, and actually I've, I experienced the other side the other day. Um, I'm in Ireland at the moment and, um, doing a bit of traveling and, uh, people are like, well, you got to try the Guinness in Ireland. So I went out and tried the, tried the Guinness and I haven't had wheat for a while. And clearly there's, there's some wheat or barley in there. And, uh, you know, after I drank it, it tasted good for the first you know, 60 seconds. And then after I drank it, my st- stomach started going and, uh, it didn't feel very good. So, you know, but, uh, but yeah, the, the clarity bit is key, right? I mean, that's, uh, it's, it's good to feel like that. Look, it really is. And it, clarity is not only that we, we wipe out the toxins that have been, um, probably sitting in our fat cells for a long time. So let's go um, let's explain the toxins and then um, yes, I want please, to explain. Yeah. yeah, let me explain where they sit and how they sit. So let's take a, a person that is an evolutionist. So, so somebody who uh, is not a modern day person, but is someone like a hunter gatherer. So their life was punctuated by seasons. And as I alluded to, they, they ate certain foods in the summer and they were saturated fats and sweet fruits and carbohydrates and that enabled them to put on weight and that weight um, was put on to um, create a, a hormone change so that we could get pregnant it's it, it's all about the perpetuation of the species and so in the summer the five kilos would and they say it's about five kilos would go on that would increase the amount of leptin in our body which is the master hormone it would then say to males and females yahoo let's have some fun and at, at, as the summer was going through you would get pregnant the woman would get pregnant and then nine months later which was the spring after losing all the weight because the food was less then the baby would be born and there'd be food available. So that was the ebb and flow of our lives. If we didn't get pregnant, then the ebb and flow, or a male, then the ebb and flow would be gain weight, then lose it in the winter because there wasn't a lot of food around. Mm. So if there was a volcano that erupted and there was a lot of mercury and um, other heavy metals that were expelled out of the environment, the body knew how to deal with these heavy metals. So it had the gut microbiome that would hang on to these heavy metals and flush it out through the fecal um, movements. There was, if it got into the blood, you had a system in the blood system that if there was mercury or heavy metals in the system, it knew how to get rid of it and it would either put it through the kidneys or through the liver and back out through the bowel system. And the third one was if there was way too much heavy metal and toxicity, it would put it into the fat. And the fat when you released it in the winter, um, that was a time that it could release all those toxins. But we don't live that life anymore where every year we release toxins. Mm. We may go 10 years and finally go, oh, my gosh, I need to lose weight, and then you lose all that toxicity and sometimes you get worse because you are releasing it um, in a a forceful manner and um, it becomes a real issue. And that affects not only the physical body, but that will affect the brain as well. So that's, um, you know, regarding that toxicity. Now, when the microbiome is not working well, so that, by the way, that toxicity would also um, cause brain for brain fog or mm. non-clarity. I so just wanted the more to, you I just collect... Wanted, sorry, I was just going to ask about the, the toxicity side 
Um, so you talked about like tr- traditionally releasing it in the winter. It's almost like a bear who eats loads of berries and then goes to hibernate and burns its fat. Um, so my question is when you're releasing the, when the, when the fat's being burnt, if you're doing it under duress, like you're on a treadmill, modern day conditions, and therefore there's going to be more cortisol present, does that make it more toxic or more impactful on you? Depends on, on what you're consuming. Because if you're consuming um, what I call the SAD diet, which is the if I was to say the standard American diet or the standard Australian diet mm-hmm. or wherever you live, it's that standard diet. If you're eating that and on the treadmill, you're going to be, you, you know, your hormones are going to be out of balance. You could be in a very um, sympathetic dominance, which means you're producing more stress. You're hunched forward. You're on a fight flight, yeah. um, which means your digestive system isn't working. Um, you, the blood goes to your muscles and, and and people don't realize that when they put their body into that sympathetic dominance, um, that they, that it, they become very toxic. It's okay to do it occasionally mm. because that was the way we were. We were in a fight flight situation. That's our sympathetic. But then we want to go back to our parasympathetic, which was having babies, digesting food, building muscle. And many people are in sympathetic dominance these days because they're so stressed. They're in a stressful, not only are they, you know, on the treadmill, their microbiome isn't working, they're eating the wrong foods, they've got a boss that's at their throat, they've got timetables, they're running late, they're, you know. Yeah, all over and, the place. And they're all over the place. And so what we've done is that we've taken this body that has taken – millions of years to evolve to where we are now using foods, understanding it's sympathetic, it's parasympathetic, knowing how it worked. And we've thrown it into a stressful situation with non-nutrient foods, heaps of um, chemicals, medications that we take to dull the symptom. And then we think that we're meant to, our body's meant to survive. We, we go, well, what's wrong? What, what, what have I done wrong? But what I do in this modern world is I go, well, let's start faking what our evolutionary body needs, and that is foods that we've always eaten, which are real foods, Um, trying to stay away from the heavy metals and the chemicals as much as possible. That's not easy, but trying to stay away from it. Having a, a diet that is seasonal where you do have that ebb and flow, where in the summer you are gaining that weight and in the winter you're losing it. And I know this sounds like a lot of stuff, but when we do it step by step and bit by bit and it becomes an education for people because the more informed you are, the better your choices will be. The better your questions are, the better answer you will get. And and that's what we do and that's what I've always done is that I want to inform people that, you, you cannot continue to live like we're living right now. And, and one of the other things that you touched on, and I really want to talk about this, and that is, is, it, is alcohol, that when you drink alcohol, you feel, you know, worse because you think you've got a cleaner body. But sometimes what happens, and, and this, this may resonate with some people, is do you notice that there are some people out there that can drink and drink and drink and drink and they still look like they're sober? And the second another person can have one glass of wine and it looks like they've had 20 glasses of wine. Mm-hmm. And what happens is that we have this a dysbiosis in our microbiome and there are certain um, parts of our microbiome that produce excessive acetylaldehyde, which is an alcohol. And so all you're doing, and that's why you've got this foggy brain, um, you may, because your microbiome's in dysbiosis, you might have a foggy brain. The minute you have a glass of wine, you feel completely drunk because all you're doing is topping up your alcohol limit. And I know of people who have had alcohol breath tests that haven't drunk alcohol in a week and and actually show that they have alcohol in their blood system Mm. because of this dysbiosis that's happening and the acetyl alcohol that they are, um, are producing. Yeah, that's super interesting. I used, I did used to be a better, I did used to be a better drinker though. I mean, I grew up in England. I used to be able to drink a lot. And I think, you know, I know a lot of people who talk about cutting out carbs and, 
and that sort of thing certainly find it harder um, as a result of that. I don't know if it's less water retention and therefore dehydration or what, but uh, yeah. Yeah, because, it, you know, um, when you're a fat burner, you, you're not holding a water weight. There's usually not eating it. Um, you're, just, you're just not holding it. Mm. Um, and, and let's have a look at the ketogenic diet versus all the other diets that are out there. So if we have a look at cultures that still exist today around the world, the cultures have adapted to the food that's available in their environment. So let's have a look at uh, the Hadzas in Tanzania. They don't eat any dairy, no legumes and no grains. They live on meat, um, small game meats. They live on um, any berries or nuts and seeds that they may find in their area. And they live on very, very um, fibrous, tuberous um, vegetables. Mm. And they have a microbiome that helps them digest that. But then let's take um, – so they've got a very varied diet. But then let's take the Papua New Guineas, the, the tribes that are not the cannibals, but they're, they're called the Lani and the Dani. They eat mainly sweet potato or tuberous vegetables or root vegetables, and their, their diet is 95% carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And they don't have the anxiety and they don't have, you know, in their native lands they, you know – the, and they're living their native lives, they just don't have what modern day people have. So here we have a varied diet. And now I've just told you about a diet that's high carbohydrate. And now let's look at the Inuits. Their diet is very ketogenic. And in the winter, they would eat a very ketogenic diet where it's blubber and protein. But in the summer, if there was carbohydrates available, they would eat it. And if it was a bad summer, where there was no carbohydrates available, the women would go into uh, infertility. And mm. they would go into infertility because if you have a baby when there's been a couple of bad seasons, then you're not going to survive and, and neither will that baby. So the ketogenic diet um, was a way of survival, uh, but it also indicated to the evolutionary body, if it went on for year after year, that perhaps... Um, there were bad seasons and we needed to create infertility. Um, and that would be intermittent infertility. It would not be complete infertility at all. It would just be the body closing down mm. because of that fact. And then we have the massa. They ate nothing but protein, milk, blood, and meat. And then you have the timbers and the pamirs who eat nothing but dairy, fermented dairies. So, you can see that cultures have adapted to whatever is available, whether it be a high protein, high fat, high carbohydrate, they were able to adapt. And the, the, the paleo um, followers, and I have no problem with the paleo diet because I believe that some people need to go there in order to heal, but the paleo followers have always said, genetically, we've never, ever adapted to eating grain. But genetically, we ha probably haven't, adapted to many foods, but our microbiome, which it adapts on a daily basis, is able to adapt to our changing environments and our changing foods. Otherwise, we wouldn't have survived. We would never have survived the march from the equator down to the southern reaches of Namibia and um, down near Kenya, uh, not Kenya, to Namibia and Zimbabwe and Zambia. Mm. So... Uh, you know, this, what people don't realize is that there is no perfect diet. What there is, is our ability to adapt to the foods. And I can tell you right now that we're in what we call disevolution, where our culture is driving our changes and we can't um, adapt to those changes. So the foods that we consume have additives, preservatives and flavorings. In combination, we don't know what they're doing. We have only tested them singularly on mice and rats. So we're eating these foods. We're eating a lot of wheat. We're eating foods that have been sprayed with neurotoxins and toxins that kill our microbiome. So, and we can go in and talk about um, one that is being, um, I think is, is, is probably the scourge of the microbiome as far as um, sprays being put on many of our foods, playgrounds, road verges, sports grounds, golf club, golf um, greens. So we're not only 
feeding our microbiome foods that it doesn't know, it can't seem to adapt to and is producing metabolites that are poisoning us, we're actually killing our microbiome so much so that it can't produce our neurotransmitters, it can't produce our aromatic amino acids, it can't produce the things that we need in order to survive mentally and physically. And it's And unless we start to make changes and unless people educate themselves and become aware of this, then as generations pass, we're just going to get sicker and sicker. There's going to be more mental um, health problems and there's going to be more physical health problems, which we're seeing in this next generation. I I see it amongst 20-year-olds all the time. It's it's really sad. Yeah. Um, Just before we move on, I I did want to mention about the – I find the – the the fertility piece interesting because uh and and i'm you know i love what you said about you know there isn't one diet for everybody i think it's different depending on you know geographically where you live or your microbiome or or also whether you're male and female because um i eat a certain way and my wife joined me and started eating the same way and her period stopped um so she she had to tinker with it a little bit more to get it within something that worked for her. She reintroduced sweet potatoes and white rice, for instance. Um, whereas for me, I'm, I'm quite comfortable on being, you know, fully, fully keto and I feel good on it. Um, it's not, you know, it didn't work as well for her. Um, so I, I think it's interesting how that's kind of a modern day version of, of, uh, what you were talking about with the different tribes. Hmm. It's interesting. And I hear this a lot, you know, where, the women, the women can't do the ketogenic diet. They, they need that fat on them to produce the leptin, to get those estrogen and progesterone and, and testosterone working for them mm. so that, you know, they can have fertility. It's like it's – what people don't realize is that um, we are still a body – that was built in the dark ages long, long ago. And we're, we're through our sleeping and our circadian rhythms, through the food that we consume, um, our body's trying to adapt to that as best it can. And the way it knows to adapt to it because it's getting signals from you that are, sa- are saying, oh, my gosh, there's no carbohydrates available. That means we're having a bad summer. That means wow, I don't have the weight on and, and, and so on and so on. And that's why um, very slim women lose their um, fertility as well. Right. Um, and, she's and, lean, so, and she's lean as well. So she had, you know, those things mm, in combination, I'm pretty sure is what happened. Yeah. 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 No, no more scientists required to figure that one out. Um, <laughs> no. So moving on to your documentary is called What's With Wheat. And I've got um, I watched it. I think it's brilliant. I've watched all of the food documentaries um, and lifestyle type documentaries, and, and I absolutely loved yours. So congratulations on putting that together and, and all of the amazing people that were interviewed in it. Um, oh, thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of wrote down some questions and wanted to, to go through some of those. The first one was, which really interested me, and I wondered if you could elaborate a bit on is how Dr. Kellogg's of Cornflakes fame, um, what was his kind of role in changing eating behaviors? Yeah, he, um, he was a vegetarian and he had a sanatorium and he pushed a plant-based diet and he knew that we couldn't digest grains. He knew that they had to be prepared properly. And so he actually prepared the grain um, by uh, a soaking, like I think he um, rolled it, soaked it and cooked it so that people could digest more plant-based foods. And it was actually his brother that realized that there was a commercial venture in creating a food that was shelf stable. And they added vitamins and minerals to it, um, and they were at the time probably from foods because at that point, you know, many um, vitamins and minerals were not being made synthetically or mined. They were being extracted from food. That was put into the product, and we started to eat more and more breakfast cereals. So cornflakes was the beginning, but then there's all the wheat-based ones that came about. And now that, you know, you go to the grocery store, you've got a whole grocery aisle dedicated to breakfast cereals. Mm. And so we went away from eating um, 
actual bacon and eggs or porridges with cream or foods like that that we prepared to a very shelf-stable food. And it actually seduced, at the time, the housewife out of the kitchen and she started to look for more things that would make her life easy. So breakfast cereal was really easy. And then now our whole grocery store is shelf-stable and the housewife is definitely, and the houseman, were definitely seduced out of the kitchen because I can just go and buy a bit of lean cuisine, throw it in the microwave, and there's food. We can, you know, so that was the beginning of, number one, us eating more grain, and number two, shelf-stable food, and number three, fortification of food, and number four, the, the basically the homemaker not wanting to be in the kitchen anymore because life became easy. Mm-hmm. I, I, there's also another side story about it. It reduced the production of testosterone or something. Is that? Have you heard of that before? No, I, I actually haven't. Um, that's that's something that I didn't come across in my research, but that doesn't mean it's not out there. And uh, if we have a look at uh, grains and legumes, they do have anti nutrients in mm. them, and. I do know that, you know, let's take soya, which is a legume, has a high phytoestrogen. Um, and if we look at Queen Anne's uh, lace, is Queen Anne's lace? I think it's the herb. It um, actually was a, a modern um, day, or not a modern day, but a, a very old way of stopping fertility. So I do know that there are herbs and foods out there that can like control our hormones, can um, bind up our minerals, um, and can clot our blood. So we actually know that there are foods out there that do that. I don't know the connection, though, between corn and testosterone. But now that you've said it, Tim, I'm going to look it up. Yeah, there, there's something there. I don't I have to look it up as well. If I find it, I'll send it to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I've, I've watched that or read that somewhere else. But, yeah, it's interesting. Mm. And then, And then kind of... Moving forward from there, um, for the, for the, for the benefit of the listener, and I've kind of seen this in, in other places as well, but there was a big movement from, uh, a gentleman called Ansel Keys, who was basically blaming a lot of the, the world's, at that time, blaming a lot of the world's problems on dietary fat. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And so Ansel Keys was an epidemiologist, um, and, he had a theory, and the theory was exactly that, is that heart disease, which was starting to increase in um, the modern man, um, well, he believed it was associated with fat and mainly saturated fat. And so he went around the world doing epidemiological studies, um, and I believe he went to between 21 and 22 countries around the world and and did an epidemiological study on how much fat and how much heart, how much fat they eat versus how much heart disease they had. And what was interesting is that out of those countries, only seven fitted his theory. So he threw all of the other countries out that didn't fit his theory. And he went to the American Heart Foundation at the time and presented his paper and showed that these seven countries, um, that were on his theory that heart disease was caused by saturated fat. And from there, it became the biggest meme of all where we were told that fat caused heart disease and, of course, margarine came in, low-fat foods came in, and we sacrificed fat for sugar. And we no longer were eating fat, we just started to eat sugar. And now we see 50 years on where we've eaten, generations have eaten just sugar because it's replaced the fat uh, and nobody's cared about the sugar content. We now see generations where we have diabetes, uh, we have more heart disease. In, in actual fact, since the 1950s versus now, heart disease has increased, it hasn't decreased. And, and so there was a movement towards us eating more grain. There was also at that time the beginning of nutritional guidelines and the food pyramid. And the the whole food pyramid was based on industry and and the the realization that meat and vegetables and fruit were 
more expensive than grain. And so they moved grain, which was at the top of the pyramid, down to the bottom of the pyramid. Mm. And so we started to eat more grain. And, it, and you just have to have a look at someone's diet these days. They have breakfast cereals for breakfast. They then might have crackers or muffins for lunch, uh, for morning tea. Then lunch, they'll have a sandwich. Afternoon tea, they may have crackers and cheese. And then for dinner, they'll eat pasta. And, and so it's become a grain based diet as opposed to what we used to eat, which was bacon and eggs, um, maybe a salad. Maybe we'd have a sandwich at lunch, um, and meat and veggies for dinner, which would have been, you know, that's how I was brought up in the sixties and seventies. I don't ever remember a dinner without meat. Pasta yeah. was not even on the menu. We didn't, you know, we had Italians living in Melbourne, but no Italians were really living in Bendigo. So we didn't have that influence back in the sixties and seventies. So yes, Ansel Keys was very much a pivotal point. His research was a pivotal point where we stopped eating fats and we started to eat more grain um, products and wheat being the billion dollar industry um, took up the slack of that and just, and now wheat's found everywhere in everything, in medications, in vitamins and minerals, mm. uh, in um, door frames. Uh, I, I saw a documentary on um, they make a ceiling um, stramet. It's called stramet here in Australia, and it's all um, the wheat, uh, not the grain, but the chaff. Um, and it, it, it's just in door frames. It's everywhere. I just couldn't believe it when I, I saw this documentary. So, And it's in many of our foods. Many of our packaged foods have something that has to do with wheat in whether it's in an additive form or a flavor of some sort or a preservative or a thickener or a, or anything. It's, it's wheat based. Yeah. And I, I, there was another, uh, good documentary I watched about sugar. And, um, at the same time as Ansel Keys was saying that the fat was bad, there was a, an English researcher. I think his name was John Yudkin. Uh, hopefully I'm That's it. pronouncing yep. that correctly, yep. but. He was yep. essentially on the other side of the pond saying, actually, sugar is the problem. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just amazing to me how, though, well, Ansel Keys in particular basically changed the eating habits of a nation, if not, you know, many nations, the, right? Yes, definitely the world. We, cause not only did America change, but then the Australian Heart Foundation took on that whole theory and so australia changed england changed yeah. europe didn't change as much but south africa changed and all all these countries that had some type of english um settlement hundreds of years ago seemed to make this um change from eating you know lard and creams and cheeses mm. and fats and butters and things like that to going low fat and eating carbohydrates yeah and I see it in my parents yet, now because my parents are like, what do you mean eating lard is good for you or butter is good for you? Because they kind of had it beaten out of them and they were sold on margarine, right? Like that, exactly. That they were replaced. Mm -hmm. And so now that I, I'm kind of coming home with grass-fed butter and fat, fatty cuts of meat and they're like, oh, I don't know if you should be eating that much fat, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's hard to change once yeah. we, and and I see this all the time. Is that what uh, you know? It's like a paradigm shift. Um, they did the paradigm shift from maybe their parents eating lard and um, eggs and you know meats and fats and things like that, and then then there was this paradigm shift which then became the usual and the norm that was accepted of the low fat, and now this next generation coming through is realizing that. We got it all wrong. It mm. was all wrong. And so you see this change. But the older generation is like looking at them because it's been so drummed into them that fat is bad. Yeah. And that, you know, and wheat is the staff of life or bread is the staff of life. And they don't realize what has happened to our wheat. They don't realize, you know, how margarine's made. That's the scariest part of all. And I don't know about where you live, but. In Australia now, there is not one product on the market called margarine, mm -hmm. not one. They're all called spreads, canola yeah. spread, olive spread, proactive. Nothing has the name margarine on it because margarine now, it's just been a chameleon and now it's seen as 
something that's bad for us and we shouldn't be eating it, but mm. we can eat a vegetable spread, yeah. <laughs> a vegetable oil spread. Yeah. Or well, something with those, every time I pick them up now, they seem to have a combination of oil, vegetable oils and a variety of things kind of all mixed in there with, and interestingly, a lot of them are, are starting to introduce butter as part of the mix, but they're not, they're not totally butter. So yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult and it's kind of like, you know, what, what you were saying is that, that, that education happened to, to that generation and, uh, their parents told them so it's, it's very difficult for them to let go of that um even with uh a lot of the new kind of research that's coming out um i wanted to to talk a little bit about the farming practices just because i think that's interesting and you you alluded earlier to a specific type of chemical um i i, I guess you're talking about glyphosate um but one of the really bits that really got me in the documentary is when you talked about monocultures and how there used to be a kind of synchronicity or a harmonious living between animals and, and crops grown, and, and that just doesn't happen anymore. So could you explain that a bit more for us? Yeah. So what was happening around the 70s, there was a gentleman by the name of Norman Borlaug, and he worked for the Wheat and Corn Board. And back in the in the era, there was a lot of um, poverty and starvation happening in India and Pakistan, and there there was a, a need to produce a, a food um, that was easy to harvest, so not for them to hand harvest, which is what they were doing in, in India at the time. They would hand harvest whatever foods that they were making. But to create massive amounts of this food to feed a starving country. And so there was a hybridization and a manipulation of the grain. And um, so the short, the stem, it's called a dwarf variety. So the chaff got really small, uh, the grain, there was a bigger head, so there was more grain, and they would absolutely devour whole countrysides where the beautiful people that the tribes that live there would live off the land and there was a variety of food so then what they did was that they basically bulldozed all that down created a, a monoculture of wheat mainly was what it was and they harvested it very fast with um, mechanical means such as you know the harvesters that they now have and and so the landscape changed for India and Pakistan and then because they were not a healthy plant and there was so much of it, they became um, very much a place where pests wanted to, you know, come and land. And so sprays started to be sprayed on it. And um, and then that culture just virtually came into Australia in the 80s. This new wheat started to be grown in, the, in Australia in the 80s. In the US, I believe it was around the late 70s and 80s, this new wheat grain. And then chemicals and more chemicals had to be sprayed. And we were already spraying chemicals, like I said, um, arsenic and lead was sprayed because of a locust plague in the cornfields and wheat fields of the USA in the late 1930s, then DDT between 45 and 55, and then a new classification of chemicals was sprayed. And now what we spray uh, with gay abandon, with no um, understanding of what it's actually doing to the human microbiome, we spray a glyphosate now, and um, which is also called Roundup. And if you have a look at the amount of Roundup that was used in the late 90s compared to what is being used now, the amount is phenomenal. So in the late uh, 90s, around 65,000 million kilos was sprayed worldwide on food and on sports grounds, um, so on agriculture basically and on play areas or councils. In 2014, 875,000 million kilos were sprayed around the world. So they're spraying it on more foods. And and there's a, a group in the U.S., a, a group of mothers in the U.S. that are really against the glyphosate and know what it's doing to the microbiome. And they decided to test every red wine or every wine, sorry, white and red wine in California and not one didn't have glyphosate in in the wine. So wow. even after all the processing, it had it in the wine. So what they're doing now is that they're using glyphosate on wheat 
as a desiccant. So a desiccant means that they spray the glyphosate on the wheat three weeks before harvest. It kills the wheat. And um, But as the wheat dies and the chaff disappears, then the grain sprouts more and you, you get a higher yield and you get less chaff. And as and, and the glyphosate is still in the grain and it's in your bread. And I do believe there's a group in the UK that says, and I think it's called Not In My Bread or Not In Our Bread, and it's that they want this, the banning of glyphosate as a desiccant on all foods. So in Australia, it's, it isn't used always as a desiccant, but it is used in wet areas as a desiccant. It's used on canola, therefore glyphosate is in canola oil. Um, it's used on many stone fruits, not on it so much, but the weeds between it. It's used before planting, so they get rid of weeds before planting um, of, of grains, and that could be oats and wheats. So if we have a look at nature, we've never had a monoculture. There's always been a landscape where there's animals, there's plants, there's different plants. And you will find that some plants that are planted next to other plants resist um, pests. And that was the natural way that um, you know, we didn't have plagues and there wasn't the pests that we've had to control with these monocultures. And and so our landscape and our agriculture and the chemicals that we're using, the neurotoxins that we're using and the, the and this glyphosate, which is absolutely destroying the ecology of the soil, which then doesn't allow the plant to pull up minerals. Therefore, we're not getting the minerals in our food. We're only getting a higher yield. We're not getting a nutritional food. And then in turn, that glyphosate is in the food. We consume it. It kills the very bacteria that makes our neurotransmitters. And therefore, we have brains that don't work well. We have nervous systems that don't work well. And it's, it's absolutely um, something that isn't regulated and um, – but people are becoming aware of it. There are councils around the world that are banning it. There are provinces in Canada that have banned it. Uh, people are waking up to the reality that it's not as safe as what they first had told us. And the the um, the downside, the negative part, you would you you talk about in the documentary is the I can't I'm probably going to get this wrong, but the the shikimate pathways. That's right. Yeah. that's the word. That's the word. So the. Yeah, that's the word. So the way glyphosate works is that it, it works on the shikimate pathway of bacteria and um, plants. And then they can't make amino acids before they die. And so it just, it, it just destroys them. So the, the theory that glyphosate was safe for humans is that it didn't affect human cells. And, and that was the way it was always thought of since its conception in the 70s. And so it became something that people felt was safe to spray on their lawns. Most people have it in their sheds, um, sprayed on their lawns. Uh, councils use it. It's sprayed on foods because it was seen as it didn't affect human cells. But it does affect human bacteria. And so the more we know about the microbiome, the more we realize that um, the microbiome, parts of the microbiome do create the shikimate, have the shikimate pathway that then produce our neurotransmitters. And, so, and, and there are lots of other things that it, um, it's important um, for as well. That, um, but the glyphosate, um, we've just had new research that came out of um, the World Health Organization that it's a possible carcinogen, the glyphosate is. So that's one thing. New research that just came out last week showed that um, glyphosate affects uh, embryolog embryological cells, umbilical cells, and any new cells that are being produced, glyphosate suffocates basically. And when we look at Roundup, which has things that are called adjuncts, which help glyphosate work better, we're finding things within the Roundup that are causing um, an exaggeration of this whole problem that I've already mentioned. Because what an adjunct is, it, it makes sure that the glyphosate works better or whatever it is. So we have adjuncts in vaccines. So an adjunct will make sure that uh, the vaccine works by heightening the immune system and allowing the immune system to, you know, make antibodies. That's the theory behind an adjunct. So we see adjuncts in 
um, not only in medications, in vaccines, um, but we also see them in our agriculture in order to make sure that this works at a, a, a powerful um, rate as opposed to it not having the adjunct. Mm. So, yeah, um, it's, you know, and, and a, a, a good reason to watch the documentary is just to get more educated on glyphosate and, and, and what's going on kind of before you even consider the intolerance to gluten and all the other issues but the, the chemicals that are in it as well it's it's kind of shocking when you when you watch that it was for yeah, me <laughs> yeah yeah look it look uh, when i did all the interviews and i i had chosen the people because of their um be, because i had learned from them over the six-year period um, that I had given up wheat, I had had learnt from them. I was I was going, well, how come wheat is a problem? Why did I have a problem with wheat? So I was out there searching and I found key people that I wanted to interview. And I had interviewed um, many of the people and I asked them all the same questions about the history of wheat and, you know, the fortification of wheat and breakfast cereals and Ansel Keys. And I knew the whole story of it. But it wasn't until I went and interviewed Stephanie Seneff at MIT. So she's a senior research scientist and she's a computer analyst but has an interest in um, putting information in about health parameters and and getting the data out. And then once she's got the data out and she sees an association, then she goes looking for the science as to why that association is there. And so when I interviewed her and I was with her for quite a few hours, my jaw was on the floor as to her expertise on glyphosate and how it affects methionine, which then affects methylation, which then causes undermethylation, which then causes developmental problems in children, which has then been linked to um, this the autism rate that we're now seeing. Is it the only thing? I don't think so. I think there we have just created this cascade of events that is causing the disastrous effect we're now seeing within our children and the rate of autism that we're now seeing. I think there are other things at play here, by the way. I think that glyphosate, though, is is part of that play. So we know that it affects methionine. We also know that uh, it chelates minerals, so we're not getting the minerals that we should be having. And one of uh, the vitamins that we know that it's not producing is folic acid, and folic acid is very important for the development of the of the of the fetus and and the developing um, embryo, so it, it it shocked me and I actually changed after seeing Stephanie I actually changed the um, the documentary because it seemed to be an important part I thought it was only going to be a small part about the glyphosate and the spraying on the wheat but I had to make it more I had because I remember her saying to me. She kept saying the shikimate pathway, the shikimate pathway, and the and the cytochrome P45 enzyme, and, the, and 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 like in the end, I had to stop her and I had to say the shika what, you know <laughs> what what is this, you know the shika what, yeah. and then she explained the whole process and, and you know I had two cameramen and audio, I had my assistant and myself, and the four of us were we left her interview. And just went, this is a game changer and people need to know about this. And, 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 and that's the, you know, and, and what was interesting is that every single person that I interviewed mentioned the shikimate pathway, but because it wasn't on my radar, I didn't hear it <laughs> until I read 24 hours of transcripts. And, and went, oh my gosh, she mentioned the shikimate. He mentioned the shikimate. She make, mentioned the mm. shikimate. And, and so the shikimate pathway became, which we realize now is so important when it comes to, um, our way of thinking, how we, how our nervous system works, how our brain works. And, um, it, yeah, it, be, it became a big part of the documentary then. Not a whole part. It just was part of that, the, the whole history of the documentary. Yeah. And that and that kind of led for me on to what how we've kind of ex- exchanged. I think in the documentary you said you've we've kind of exchanged infections for disease, or for ex- exchanging infectious yes. disease for chronic disease. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yep, that's what Joel Salatin says. He he basically says instead of appreciating 
what science has given us in the way of sanitation and, you know, emergency services and how we can, you know, live a, um, a more healthy life due to all of these wonderful inventions that we have. We've simply let that pendulum swing the other way and now we, instead of these infectious diseases, we have chronic diseases such as heart disease, cancer, diabetes, autoimmune disease, which uh, um, Dr. Perlmutter says that the statistics show that it's now 17% of the American population that have autoimmune diseases, and they believe that most people don't even know they have the autoimmune disease, so we don't really know the true statistics. It's not until they become, they become chronic that they go to their doctor and they're diagnosed with you know, well, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, um, even arthritis, any other arthritis, not just rheumatoid arthritis. Dementia is even, and Alzheimer's is now seen, being seen as an autoimmune disease, so is heart disease. So we're beginning to um, put autoimmunity as actually the number one maimer and the number two killer when it comes to chronic diseases. Yeah, and for, I mean, I'm I'm a good uh, good candidate for for that stuff on some level because um, I had you know asthma, allergies to animals, allergies to pretty much everything, um, IBS, overweight, all these sorts of things, and and through the elimination of wheat and 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 other refined carbohydrates, all of those things are gone. Um, so that for me is is kind of proof that. I, and I was talking about this the other day, you know, asthma, for instance, I've given a variety of medications and different length ones. And by, uh, no, nobody at any point said, maybe it's what you're eating. They just wanted to give me things to, to cover it up basically. So interesting. Yeah, because that's, um, that's how, that's how our, our, our current system works. Our current system is you don't feel well, let's take a drug um, and the symptom goes away and you move on with your life. But if you don't take the symptom away, then the body will start yelling at you and telling you what's wrong. But we've stopped listening to our body. Mm-hmm. And so we'll, it, it doesn't matter what disease is out there. They've got a drug for it. And, you know, one of the diseases that is growing is Alzheimer's. And they they always look for this compound, and I it's just slipped my mind the name of it, um, Amala something. Anyway, they always look for this compound, and if that compound is there, they use a drug to get rid of that compound. Now, what we're just finding out is that compound is a microbial, is an antimicrobial. So the brain is trying to fix um, probably problems that are happening in the nasal passages and the sinuses, which are heading straight for the brain. And so it produces a product that is seen in Alzheimer's, but that product is actually trying to get rid of the infection that's happening or the inflammation that's happening in the brain. Mm. And so we see this all the time now. We start to realize that, um, you know, so let's look at statins. They took statin drugs to get rid of your cholesterol but cholesterol is really important for brain function it's very important for vitamin d it's important for testosterone and progesterone and estrogen and cortisol and and all we did was just go oh my gosh cholesterol's the problem let's just take it out of the diet and let's get it rid of it with statins so we we seem to do this and and now i think doctors are waking up realizing especially when they get sick, (laughs) this is when they realize it, is when they get sick and they know the trajectory of their disease and they don't want to go down that way. So they start looking for alternatives other than medications and they're finding that food is uh, one part of it, exercise is another, sunshine, sleep, connection, you know, and and, and, and as Dr. Terry Wall says, and even a loving family is all part Mm. of that. Um, what the things that we need, you know, we're just talking about food, but we know that there are other things that the evolutionary body and brain need in order to uh, be fully healthy and full of vim, basically energy and vitality. Yeah, absolutely. One thing um, I really liked was the explanation of the neural tree. Um, Mm. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, uh, 
Um, the many of the experts that I I spoke to um, were either neurologists, gastroenterologists, paediatricians, and one paediatrician in particular who was also a gastroenterologist, um, Dr. Rodney Ford, who's out of Christchurch, New Zealand, noticed that when he had completely ruled out celiac disease and completely ruled out wheat allergy, that his patients still had problems with wheat. And he noticed that these these people who had the problems with wheat could have any symptom, and it, and the symptom could have to do with brain health. It could be skin rash, could be aches and pains. He noticed that it was other than the gut. It, it, they were, he was seeing other problems, and and he he noticed that what gluten um, was affecting was the nervous system or the neural tree. And when you think about the nervous system, the nervous system is the brain and spinal cord, but then it has feeders that follow blood vessels that go everywhere in the body. And so the the, the, the belief that the, the gastrointestinal tract, which could be compromised, um, then sends out messengers um, that affects the nervous system and causes inflammation, and that inflammation could be anywhere. And the neural tree is what um, the nervous system is. He he indicated it to be called the neural tree as opposed to the nervous system. And so where does that inflammation go? Um, I was talking to Dr. Alicia Fasano, and, and I said to him, how come it can affect brain, joints, pancreas, you know, type 1 diabetes, you know, how can it affect these things? And and how do we know who, who is going to be affected by what? And he, and he explained it to me like this. He said, well, Cindy, when you figured that one out, you may just get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we don't even, we don't know why it affects one person one way and one person another, but we do know that it has something to do with the nervous system because some people are affected by gluten very quickly, either with a migraine or um, a skin rash, within 20 minutes of eating it. And he says that that cannot have it, that's not the gut. So it has to be the neural tree. It has to be the nervous system that is being affected. Yeah. Interesting stuff. And, and uh, I find as well myself, like there's some, in terms of wheat and gluten, you kind of have to, you end up having to be a bit, bit anal and, and kind of police about it because they they sneak it into lots of things right um and then when you yeah. go out to eat you're then beholden to 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 other people and kind of what they put in the recipes they're cooking so how do you how do you deal with that or and or kind of where are the unsuspecting places where gluten is found well one of the things that we realized once we'd finished um the documentary it, is that this would be very foreign to people. That they couldn't have their breakfast cereals and their crackers and their pastas and their breads and, you know, and, and it would become very foreign. So we actually created um, a program off the documentary called Six Weeks No Wheat. And in that we indicate everything that we know has gluten or wheat or some sort of substrate or something from it. And the list is huge, but if I was to give it to you generally, most packaged foods will have wheat in it in some manner, most, not all, but most. Um, vitamins and minerals may have wheat in it. For instance, uh, scorbic acid is actually made from wheat. Is there any gluten in it when it gets to the point where it is ascorbic acid? Who knows, but, you know, I'm just telling you that we don't, most people don't realize ascorbic acid is its original source is wheat. So it goes wheat, glucose, fermentation processes to get to ascorbic acid, which is not vitamin C. It's just ascorbic acid, which was termed ascorbic because it was to stop scurvy. So ascorbic stop scurvy. That's, that was the name of it. But, you know, it was never produced from wheat. It was always produced, you know, they, they extracted it, but no longer, you know, we can't extract enough in order to um, mm-hmm. feed the market that's out there. It's also an excipient within 
um, vitamins and minerals. So, you know, you have to be really careful. You have to read the ingredients. That's the most important thing to do on your supplements. Medications will often have wheat in it. And because they don't put the medications on there, they don't put the medications on there, um, I mean, the ingredients on there, you, you have to either ring the manufacturer and ask. Today, for instance, it was really interesting. This gentleman was asking me about this product, and I, I said to him, well, the ingredients say that it's such and such a plum, but I can tell you that that doesn't taste like such and such a plum that's been dried. I can taste other things in it. Can I please have the spec sheet for that? And so I got the spec sheet for it. And on the spec sheet, there are six other ingredients in it, and one of them was a wheat-based ingredient mm. that they're not putting on the ingredient. So we go through all of this in the six weeks, no wheat. But I think what's really, really important is um, that you start going back into the kitchen because I feel if we get back into the kitchen, we'll feed our family and we'll heal a nation. And we've got to stay away from packaged foods because in the U.S. They're, they've now passed that – you can actually have traces of gluten in a food that says gluten-free. They actually allow the, the manufacturers to contaminate to a certain point. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't even trust gluten-free anymore because you don't know whether it's contaminated. And if if you watch the, the documentary What's With Wheat and you listen to Terry Walls, well, Terry Walls talks about, you know, the fact that she can't even have any on her skin let yeah. alone consume it because she has the effects of it. So um, it's. I think it's about we have to go back to buying our foods from the farmer's markets and making fruit from scratch. If you have a problem with gluten and mm -hmm. or wheat or you have inflammatory processes or you have an autoimmune disease because there's not only celiac disease, there's wheat allergy and there's also – non-celiac wheat sensitivity that was named in 2012 and has now been confirmed as a disease. And then you have autoimmune diseases that are now being linked to um, gluten. Whether they, whether they cause it or they perpetuate it is, is something that we are just beginning to understand. Um, and gluten does cause um, the intestinal lining to become compromised and the gates open and allows other products to go in there, which um, make, you know, set up the system where the body doesn't know what is its thyroid and what is its bacteria and it has to destroy the bacteria, but it destroys the thyroid as well. And that, that's what autoimmune disease is, is when the body's lost the intelligence to know what is itself and what is its enemy. Lots to think about for sure. Um, yeah, yeah and, and I will say that, um, you know, for, for people listening, I'm going to put the links in the show notes, but uh, at whatswithwheat.com, there's loads of, I've been reading through the blogs and there's a variety of tips about how to make going gluten-free easier. There's obviously the six weeks no wheat course, which you can participate in and, and start moving in the right direction. Um, but the first things first, um, how can people, when can people and how can people get access to the documentary? Well, uh, you can go to whatswithweight.com and uh, you can download it yeah. um, for, uh, for rental or you can buy the DVD. Um, I do know in December that um, we are going into probably 100 million homes in the U.S., so it will be available through smart televisions um, on various mediums, um, Netflix, etc. Uh, you can uh, Food Matters TV. If anybody is a member of Food Matters TV, I believe October that they are going to start um, showing the movie. But if people want to watch it right now and they're not prepared to wait, go to whatswithweek.com and just you can rent the movie and, and watch it at your leisure. Yeah, and I would say, you know, it's, it's it was a game changer for me in terms of the, the education. Um, so I think, uh, I don't know, I think it's less, I'm guessing it's like $10, $15 or something to get it, but it's money well spent in terms of that education to, to, to just inform yourself. And I think, as you said, quite rightly so, Cindy, that this is, it's not about changing a, a lifetime's habits overnight. It's about incremental change, but 
education and knowledge and being able to ask the right questions and therefore get the right answers is just a huge piece of the puzzle for me. Um, so, so thank you for all your I, I wisdom and expertise more. today. Thank you, Tim. I, look, it's, um, you've asked some really good questions and you've obviously really watched that documentary and, um, and got the best out of the information that people need in order to move forward. And, um, it's not, um, it's uh, just so your listeners know, it's, I think, 797 to download it, Australian dollars. So if you live in the UK, you know, it's a couple mm. of pounds. And if you live in the US, it's like $4. So it's not an expensive video to sit down and watch as a family or get a group of friends together because I think sometimes you almost need to discuss at certain aspects of it. And I yeah. have medical doctors that are now using it um, when they know that their patients need to go off wheat, they're not specialists in that, and they give the documentary to them. They say, I want you to watch this, and then I want you to go on the program six weeks, no wheat. So we've, we're making it easy for the non-nutritionist, non, you know, the, the person that doesn't know how to advise about diet, doesn't have mm. this knowledge, but has an idea that this is what this patient needs or their client needs. And so, it's being used in in um, t as teaching aids in agriculture. It's used in schools, so it's it's getting out there, and and more and more people are realizing that the story of wheat is the story of food. Yeah, and we need. I just picked wheat, and I and I picked it because it was something near and dear to my heart. But I could choose dairy, and I could possibly do much of the same thing and learn more and more about, you know, pasteurization and homogenization and how it's changed and how it's breaking the proteins and cutting down the fat molecules. And that's a whole other story. And it may be a documentary that I will do in the future. But at the moment, I, I just want to educate people about one food rather than driving them insane and going, what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And I do just want to, I want to mention yeah. something because I think it's significant. I think it's relevant. Um, because we put a lot of trust in, in the traditional system. And I will just say that, and I'm pretty sure you mentioned this in the documentary, that doctors traditionally get 15, 20 hours nutrition education in their whole university degree or in their whole, you know, studying and education. So if we're, if we're, if you're waiting and relying on other people to give you the information, you're going to be waiting a long time. Um, so this is all about empowering you to make good decisions for you and your family. Um, and of course, you know, anxiety is, is, uh, what this podcast is about, but th this topic is about uh, all of our bodies. And, and, uh, I just think it's so important. Yeah. And that, you know, they're linking, uh, a lot of things to gluten when we can't digest it and it gets into our nervous system. And um, in the documentary, we do talk about, you know, even schizophrenia has been linked um, that when they take people off the gluten, there's less episodes of psychosis. So that's a good thing. And, and so we know that it affects the brain as well as the physical body. It's, it's the neural tree, as you mentioned, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's our whole body. Mm. Well, um, Cindy, thank you so much for A, making the documentary and B, coming on uh, the show here to tell us about it. I've really enjoyed talking to you and, and kind of extrapolating some of the, the really cool parts to share with the listeners and I hope people go and watch it for themselves. Oh, thank you, Tim. I've really enjoyed it too. All right. All the best, Cindy. All right. That was Cindy. Um, yeah, just a uh, what a wealth of knowledge, just the amount of stuff that she has gleaned and kind of put together both through real life experience and the research she's done and the, the organization she's run, um, massively beneficial. And I hope you took uh, as much of from that conversation as I did. I really enjoyed talking to Cindy and, uh, and hopefully that came through in today's episode. If you want to find out more, check out the link in the show notes. If you have any questions, go to anxietypodcast.com, click on the contact page, send me a question. Um, if nothing else, I just hope that this one and maybe the Tom O'Brien one again, episode 132, uh, get you to consider looking at your diet, looking at your nutrition as part of the solution to anxiety. I don't believe it's the 100% solution, but um, as Dave Asprey said in our interview um, some months ago, if you're doing all the other stuff right 
uh, but continuing to, um, I think he said, slap your face, slap yourself in the face with a fork three times a day, then it's very difficult to overcome that. Um, so yeah, something to think about, food for thought, as they say. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.